Hello everyone, Hound Dog here, and I'm with you again in another historical aircraft from the past 100 years of U.S. Navy carrier aviation. Today is 30 May 1957, and we are in the Lockheed T-2V Sea Star jet trainer for carrier qualifications aboard the USS Forrestal CV-59. Radio check, one, two, three, three, two, one, radio check. As early as 29 June 1945, two Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star single-seat jet fighters were transferred to the U.S. Navy for the purpose of modification and evaluation as carrier-based aircraft. In the fall of 1946, a navalized P-80 completed multiple carrier arrested landings and catapult launches on the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, but was declared unsuitable for normal carrier operations. In 1948, the Navy acquired 50 Air Force P-80 fighters and redesignated them TO-1, later changed to TV-1, for use in land-based advanced jet training of Navy pilots. A year later, the Navy procured 26 of Lockheed's newly modified TF-80C two-seat jet trainers, later designated T-33. The Navy procured a total of 699 of the new two-seat jet trainers with the designation TV-2. The two-seat Lockheed T-33 and TV-2 trainers would go on to be one of the most successful jet trainers ever produced, with 6,575 manufactured from 1948 through 1959. Some models were still serving on active duty until the late 1990s, almost 50 years. By late 1952, Lockheed had received enough feedback from both services to warrant an internally funded redesign effort to improve the jet trainer. Lockheed used a T-33 to incorporate significant improvements and produce a new prototype that first flew on 15 December 1953. The Navy, who still had a critical need for a carrier-based two-seat jet trainer, quickly accepted Lockheed's offer to loan the new prototype to the Navy for further testing and evaluation flights. In May 1954, the Navy was impressed enough to issue Lockheed a contract for eight aircraft designated T-2V-1 Sea Star. Lockheed used many of the lessons learned by the Navy in previous attempts to navalize the single-seat P-80 fighter. The Lockheed Skunk Work engineers used comprehensive feedback from their field representatives as well as direct input from actual Navy users. Lockheed had even modified a T-33 by adding a large horizontal stabilizer tail boom with two vertical stabilizers at each end to improve horizontal stability, although this idea was quickly dropped. While the new T-2V Sea Star design resembled the TV-2 T-33 Shooting Star, it was actually a whole new aircraft design with significant changes and improvements to every part of the aircraft. Besides the obvious improvements needed to beef up the structural integrity and strength of the airframe and landing gear, the main design focus was on reducing landing speeds and improving lateral stability. The fuselage midsection was lengthened by almost a foot and the rear cockpit was raised six inches for improved visibility for the instructor pilot. The side air intakes were reshaped to improve boundary layer control and ram air recovery for greater efficiency at lower landing speeds and high angles of attack. The landing gear was strengthened to withstand a drop rate of over 20 feet per second, double that of the TV2. A retractable shock absorbing arresting hook and rigid catapult fittings were added. Extensive changes were made to the wing with the span increased by 4 feet and leading edge full span mechanical slats included. The slats were free floating and automatically extended at lower air speeds, thus lowering the aircraft's stall speed. Lockheed also included another major innovation with a new boundary layer control system incorporated into the trailing edge flaps, making the T-2V the first U.S. aircraft with so-called blown flaps. 
The new system consisted of internal piping that ducted bleed air directly from the jet engine compressor stage to and across the surfaces of the flaps airfoil. This effectively delayed the separation of the boundary layer airstream, resulting in higher lift forces and an 8 mile per hour reduction in the landing speed. All of these changes did have a negative impact on weight, with the Sea Star weighing in almost 3,500 pounds more than the Shooting Star. Some of this additional weight was offset by the newer and more powerful J33 turbojet engine with 6,100 pounds thrust, a 33% increase over the 4,600 pound thrust made by the TV2's earlier J33 engine. This additional power was still not enough to make up for the Sea Star's weight gain, and the T2V's 580 mile per hour maximum speed was 20 miles per hour slower, with the service ceiling and maximum range also significantly reduced, even with the fixed wing tip tanks. However, the Sea Star's 6,330 foot per minute climb rate was actually higher than the Shooting Star's 4,870 foot per minute maximum. Continued testing of the original prototype identified the need for additional structural strengthening of the airframe and a larger dorsal fillet for the vertical stabilizer to improve directional stability. Lockheed included these new modifications to the first production T2V, which successfully completed carrier trials and certification on board the USS Antietam CV-36 in 1956. The Navy issued Lockheed another contract and took delivery of 142 new Sea Stars between 1956 and 1957. The first operational T2V Sea Star jet trainer arrived at the Naval Air Advanced Training Command at Corpus Christi on 27 May 1957. The first class of 14 student pilots reported to Air Training Unit 206, Fort Sherman Field, Pensacola, Florida, to begin carrier qualifications training in the new Sea Stars. Shortly thereafter, first carrier qualifications in a two-seat jet trainer began on board the newly assigned USS Antietam, the first angled deck carrier dedicated to flight training. On 4 May 1958, the Grumman TF-9J Cougar two-seat trainer took over duties as the Navy's advanced jet trainer and the T-2V moved to the all-jet basic training program at Pensacola. The Navy was happy to finally have a two-seat jet aircraft for carrier training and was pleased with the rapid and significant reduction in the accident rate of carrier jet fighter pilots. The T-2V lacked folding wings, but with its steerable nose wheel, the aircraft easily maneuvered on board the congested carrier deck and fit nicely on the elevators. The Sea Star was designed to have a much higher ability to withstand seawater related aircraft wear with higher humidity and salt exposure. Unfortunately, the new boundary layer controlled flaps did prove to be a maintenance nightmare and this is probably one of the reasons the Navy decided to cancel its plans to order 240 additional TV-2s in favor of the new and more advanced T-2 Buckeye manufactured by North American Aviation. In 1962, the TV-2 was redesignated the T-1A in accordance with the new Tri-Service Aircraft Designation System. T-1s were assigned to the Naval Air Station Pensacola for jet proficiency and instrument trainers, while a number of the Sea Stars were assigned to Fleet Training Squadron 10 for land-based indoctrination training of Naval Flight Officers assigned to F-4 Phantom and A-6 Intruder Squadrons. Other T-1s ended up at various naval bases, marine units, and reserve squadrons for monthly minimum flight time proficiency flights. The last active T-2V T-1A Sea Stars were struck from the Navy inventory in 1971.